Hello and welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Alexandra Paul and I'm here with my wonderful co-host Dotsie Bausch. Hi Dotsie. Hey, hey. So you and I are here together with two old friends of ours. Yes. So actually Robbie Barbaro and Cyrus, Dr. Cyrus Kambata were in one of our first shows, show nine. And they're back because they Way have back a new when. book. And so we want immediately want to talk to them about it so that you, the audience, can go out and get it because it has so much important information, whether you're diabetic or not, mm -hmm. uh, to learn about the truth about eating a plant, low fat, plant based, whole food diet. Yeah. Or know somebody who is diabetic. I have a very specific question to them uh, about um, a makeup artist that we worked with uh, with <clears throat> filming our commercials coming up this summer with nine of the world's best athletes. And her husband is diabetic. And what's happened to him over just two weeks of them completely and totally changing over overnight, literally, to a whole food plant based diet. It's just uh, it's all inspiring. Yeah. But I want to get the science behind why that you know, that has happened to him, his, his transformation. And she and he are listening. They had they binge watched. 52 episodes of the Switch for Good podcast since, since two weeks ago. So I don't know. Including the one with Cyrus of course, and Robbie. Of course, so that yes. Was great. I said, well, make sure you listen to them. They go, oh, she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I did. <laughs> okay. Oh, man. So we are, yeah, we're pretty pumped. And for multiple reasons, but uh, one of the main reasons is because, um, you know, diabetes is, is an epidemic uh, in this country and all over the world. Here's a shattering fact, something that really struck me hard that I did not know. Every 21 seconds, someone new is diagnosed with diabetes. So as you mentioned, two of our former guests in our first 10 episodes are back to chat about their new book, Cyrus Kambata and Robbie Barbera, the healthy minds behind the Mastering Diabetes coaching program. They originally shared their story and wellness tips with us back in episode nine, but you're going to need a refresher. I know I do. It's complicated stuff. Uh, and the wool has been pulled over our eyes in terms of what actually causes diabetes. So go back to nine and take a listen, because we're not going to go back through their whole stories, which are fascinating within themselves. But today, we're going to take a really deep dive into their latest work, Mastering Diabetes, the Revolutionary Method to Reverse Insulin Resistance Permanently in Type 1, Type 1.5, yes, there is a type 1.5, which I know in uh, episode nine, you and I were like, what? what? Yeah, that was news to us. And <laughs> yeah. It's probably news to a lot of people now, so it's great that we're right. talking about it. Um, type 2, which is the most common, uh, pre-diabetes, and then also gestational diabetes. And that's a bold claim. So, Robbie, Cyrus, here we go. <laughs> Thanks for being on again. Yeah, thank you guys so much for uh, inviting us back to be on this podcast. You guys are a true force for good, and we appreciate the uh, the opportunity. I just want to know that Robbie is eating, and he is <laughs> eating an huge salad with fruit in it, and that's what we're going to also talk about is diabetics are, are incredibly afraid of fruit, but Robbie and Cyrus are not. In fact, uh, most of their diet is made up of fruit, and so we'll be talking about that. Okay. I, for those who weren't watching, I just wanted to note a little bit right. of the ambiance, which is Robbie eating this huge, <laughs> yummy salad. The guy that sounds like a horse in the background <laughs> is Robbie. <laughs> so, I but, wish uh, I could share the salad with everybody listening. It's, it's absolutely delicious. It has persimmons and dates, you said. Yes. And Asian pears and mixed greens. And behind Robbie is our bananas and persimmons and mangoes and papayas. It's an amazing array of fruit because that's how much fruit he eats. Mm -hmm. And Cyrus is uh, coming to us from Costa Rica. With, Poor guy. Yeah. Right next to his cat who actually eats broccoli and cauliflower because she loves it. Yeah. By choice. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Yes. Uh, we are not trying to feed our cat a vegan diet. <laughs> but they know that we are the, the, the plant-based weirdos around here and they, they dabble and they, they started sniffing our food and picking out broccoli and cauliflower. So we started feeding it to them and they that's love great. it. <laughs> so listen, we had you on. So people who want to hear about your story, they should definitely go back to episode nine. We want to get to the point here. Why did you write this book? So the reason we wrote this book that you can see on the screen right here called Mastering Diabetes, the reason we wrote this book is because there's a lack of good evidence-based information in the world of diabetes about the true power of using a plant-based diet to not manage but reverse insulin resistance. 
and reverse prediabetes and type 2 diabetes and get incredible blood glucose control in type 1 and 1.5. Um, as you guys probably know, there's a little bit of a nutritional circus which is happening on the internet these days, right? You have, it, there's a lot of conflict, low carb, high carb, low fat, high fat, low dairy, high dairy, low fiber, high fiber, carnivore, plant-based, vegan, you name it. Your average person is you know, looking for ways to improve their health if they're living with any form of diabetes or pre-diabetes. They go to the internet, they go to YouTube, they go to Instagram, and they're looking for information. And within 24 hours, they're like, wow, this is confusing. Mm -hmm. there's, a yeah. lot of, there's a lot of conflicting opinions, and there's a lot of really frustratingly complex advice. I don't know what to do. You know what? Not even the experts can agree. I'm going to do nothing, right? Yeah. And so what we decided to do is put together a book that we want to serve as like the manifesto. That's the way we're looking at it. It's like this is, this is a Bible of diabetes knowledge that teaches you what actually causes the underlying, uh, you know, what causes blood glucose fluctuations in, the, in like what, what is its root cause and then how you can measure and diagnose that root cause and then how you can actually reverse it using your food as medicine. Mm -hmm. So that's where the concept of mastering diabetes was born. And that's what we spent more than two years putting into this book. And we have one thing that I would also like to state is that uh, we, we spent a lot of time digging deep into the research to try and understand, you know, is what we say true? And we went back to the drawing board. Are we making things up? Are we only telling people that eating a plant-based diet is good because Robbie experienced it and I experienced it and, and we know it's good for us, right? So what we did is as we were going through the research, we really like did a deep, deep, deep dive to try and understand what is the opposite side saying and what is the research they use and what is the plant-based world use and what's the union between the two of them and what's confusing and what's not. And so we've tried to be as unbiased as possible and as, as objective as possible in presenting research that truly is powerful. And that's what we try to do in this book with over 800 references. And we truly hope that it makes a difference in your life. I'll also add that part of the reason we wrote the book is because people kept on asking us to write the book. After three years of running a coaching program, having over 3,000 people go through it, getting all these amazing results, people are like, hey, when are you going to write a book? When are you going to have this resource that I can just hand to my friend who's trying to understand what I'm doing and why it's working? So uh, we took the request seriously and, and we put the time in to create what we're really proud of. And like Cyrus said, we hope it's a, it's a manifesto and a resource that can be used for years to come. Oh, I can really mimic exactly what you were saying, Cyrus, about such con it's there's so much confusion that then it catapults people into doing absolutely nothing. Uh, that makeup artist that I was speaking about in the opening, um, she when I sat down with her a couple Mondays ago um, to start the day, she said I watched she said her husband and she binge watched documentaries and they watched forks over knives and they watched game changers and they also watched fat and a couple of the other um keto and paleo type documentary and she said we on one day just straight through them and she felt so disillusioned and so confused and so frustrated that they did exactly that nothing they woke up the next day and said well there's obviously you know and they didn't do anything and it wasn't until uh and, and this is kudos to you guys for your powerful personal stories that you have told for many years before writing this book, because I think it's a combination of that plus the science. It wasn't until she sat down and had in her chair nine of the world's best athletes that she went home and said, okay, right? These stories I cannot deny and we want to feel better and I want my husband to feel better um, and changed over to, to whole food plant-based overnight. Um, and and then she will probably be one of your first people to buy the, this book. <laughs> We're going to make sure of that. Yeah. Um, I just want to I want to go back because I before we had you on last year, yeah. I was confused about diabetes. And you mentioned a term insulin resistance and blood glucose re control. Most people, when they think of diabetes, they just think you can't eat sugar because you don't want your sugar to go up. Yet you said the most important thing is to deal with insulin resistance. Can you talk about your philosophy in terms of how to deal with diabetes? And then we can go deeper into the, more of the, the um, details of it. 
For sure. That's a great question. So um, if we go back to the beginning and we say, well, well, what is diabetes? And what is type 2 diabetes in particular? Because type 2 diabetes affects 92% of the, of the diabetes population. Okay, we're looking at more than 30 million diagnosed people in the United States and upwards of 85 million undiagnosed people in the United States. So a very large numbers of people, right? So if you go back and try and figure out, well, what the heck is type 2 diabetes? What you will find is that type 2 diabetes is just a collection of symptoms. That may sound weird to say that, but type 2 diabetes is a collection of symptoms that manifests itself with a, one of the symptoms is a high blood glucose value, okay? But before you develop type 2 diabetes, you develop a condition known as pre-diabetes, but before you develop pre-diabetes, you develop a condition known as insulin resistance. So in other words, you cannot develop type 2 diabetes without first becoming pre-diabetic, I'm sorry, without first becoming insulin resistant, mm -hmm. And then transitioning to pre-diabetes and then transitioning to type 2 diabetes. They are prerequisites. So what is insulin resistance? Now, insulin resistance is basically a condition that is, um, that is strongly associated with the type of food that you eat and the amount of food that you eat. It's also associated with your activity levels. It's also associated with how much alcohol you drink and how, how high stress your lifestyle is. So insulin resistance is influenced by, number one, a diet that has excess calories. So you mean it, it's when you say influenced by, how is it influenced? Okay. You can increase your risk for the development of insulin resistance by eating a diet that is hot, has excess calories, period, end of story. Okay. Excess calories is number one. Uh, number two, excess saturated fat is number two. Okay. And there's a lot of people who right there would be like, whoa, 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 whoa. That is not a true statement, right? And they would, they would have problems with me saying that, but I'm going to get back to that in one second. Um, excess refined carbohydrates, cookies, crackers, chips, bread, cereals, pastas, pastries. Um, people who eat more of those are at a higher risk for insulin resistance. Okay. If you're sedentary, higher risk for insulin resistance. Okay. If you drink a lot of alcohol, higher risk for insulin resistance. If um, you live a high stress lifestyle, higher risk for insulin resistance. And if you don't have diabetes or pre-diabetes that you know of, what is the normal blood sugar um, that would, would, would raise up to if I had, if I, who's on a whole food plant-based diet and eat low saturated fat, if I had two bananas or three bananas, it wouldn't okay. go up anywhere near the skyrocket of, of someone who is in insulin resistance. Exactly. So you guys are both non-diabetic, which is awesome. We want to keep you there. Good job. Yeah. Your blood glucose, if we were to check your blood glucose at any point during the day, your blood glucose would likely be between 70 at its very lowest and about 130, maybe 140 at its very highest. And it would just kind of like hover in that window between 70 and 140 all day long every single day. Because your pancreas and liver are talking to each other 24 hours a day and they're making sure that they keep your blood glucose nice and well controlled because that protects tissues all throughout your body against inflammation. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But like we were saying, you know, a, a person with insulin resistance or existing diabetes would eat one banana and their blood glucose would go up into the 200s, 180, 200, 220, 240, you name it. And then they come to the conclusion that carbohydrates are bad. I shouldn't eat carbohydrates. See, I told you, Dr. Atkins was right. I should eat a low-carb diet. The paleo revolution, they're right. I should eat a low-carb diet. The ketogenic revolution, they're right. I should eat a low-carbohydrate diet, okay? But the truth is that the only reason why eating a carbohydrate-rich food caused this traffic jam of glucose and <laughs> Sorry, the cat just walked across there for people that are listening. <laughs> I, think, I think the cat might have muted you, Cyrus. Cauliflower, like, fueled cat just walked across. Oh, okay, sorry about that. She, she got jumps when I started talking about it. <laughs> okay, so the, the reason that there's a traffic jam of glucose and a traffic jam of insulin in your blood is not because the carbohydrate caused it. It's because it's because everything that before you ate that carbohydrate rich food set the stage for insulin resistance, right. which then initiated a traffic jam. So if we go back and try to figure out, well, what's what caused that traffic jam to begin with? The answer is a diet that's high in saturated fat is the number one most primary cause. 
But again, I also want to talk about the fact that there's, you know, a diet that's just too high in calories, just literally over consuming calories is also not beneficial. That will also trigger much of the same mechanisms that I just described. And then also a diet that's high in refined carbohydrates Mm -hmm. can cause insulin resistance primarily inside of your liver tissue. Okay. So can I just summarize what you said and you can tell me, uh, is that the reason that you have diabetes is because there's too much fat in your cells that doesn't let the sugar in so it hangs out in the blood so the problem is the fat and the sugar is the symptom and when people go on these low-carb diets they think oh yeah this is really good for my diabetes but actually it's just it's just like you're not you're just not dealing in the symptoms you you still have the issue and they're only testing the symptoms your blood glucose like there's no exactly. test to look deeper. So it, it's exactly. just, just yeah. right, like the Band-Aid. And in fact, in your book, you talk about how people who eat low low carb actually have more insulin resistance. Um, did I yeah, get- okay. here's, here's the kicker. Um, if you eat a low carbohydrate diet, um, your blood glucose is likely to look better. You're, okay, here's what happens. People with diabetes, pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, you name it. Um, they, they're, whether they're overweight or not, the fact of the matter is they're diabetic. They start eating a ketogenic diet. And the first thing that happens is weight loss, rapid weight loss. They lose one pound, two pounds, three pounds per week. And before they know it, also they're like, Oh my God, I lost, I lost 30 pounds in the last six weeks. That's incredible. A ketogenic diet is high fat, right? A ketogenic diet is high fat, very low carbohydrate. Okay. Okay. So people eat a ketogenic diet, they lose weight. As a result of losing weight, they drop their blood cholesterol. So their total cholesterol comes down, their triglyceride level comes down, their blood pressure comes down, their A1C value comes down, which is a marker of diabetes. Their fasting glucose comes down, their fasting insulin comes down. These are all good things. These are all good things. And so they, they do a ketogenic diet and then they look at their blood work and they're like, wow, that's amazing. I did the ketogenic thing. Now I see all these improvements in my, in my um, in these biomarkers, it looks like I solved the problem. I don't have diabetes anymore. Okay. And the truth is that, hold on a second. I'm, I'm proud of you for getting your biomarkers in a much healthier state. Hats off to you. I'll give you a giant high five. But making the statement that I don't have diabetes anymore is a fallacy. It is not a true statement because just because your biomarkers improve does not mean that you don't have diabetes. The way to determine whether or not you actually have diabetes is to, is to challenge your glucose metabolism by eating something that either contains glucose or something that contains carbohydrate. Okay. So let's back up here. You go to the American Diabetes Association website and you take a look and you say, what are your diagnostic criteria for developing type two diabetes? In other words, how would I know if I have type two diabetes? The answer is one of three things will happen. Number one, either your fasting blood glucose is greater than 126. Okay. So first thing in the morning with no food, if it's higher than 126, boom, that means you have type two diabetes. Number two, if at any point in the day, I were to check your blood glucose and you are over 200, that means you have type two diabetes. Number three, if you were to take a thing called an oral glucose tolerance test, you would fail. And what that means is that you can go to the doctor and you can get this little solution of water with 75 grams of glucose in it. You drink it. And then over the course of the next two hours, if your blood glucose goes up over 200 at any point in that two hour window, boom, you have type two diabetes. Okay. So those are the three diagnostic criteria. Now, if you go into the research and you take a look at what happens with diet, with a, you know, ketogenic diets, what you'll find is that fasting blood glucose often comes below 126. Awesome. Okay. Random finger stick blood glucose often comes, never even approaches 200. Awesome. That's great. But the ketogenic world will not use an oral glucose tolerance test to challenge their glucose metabolism. And in, without performing that test to actually determine what would happen to your blood glucose, if you were to eat something that contains 75 grams of glucose, you cannot say that you're not living with type 2 diabetes, Mm -hmm. right? That'd be like saying, oh, yeah, you know, like I'm the best cyclist in the world, right? And then you'd be like, well, how about we challenge you versus the reigning world champion? Be like, nope, not going to do it. Sorry. (laughs) 
That's for sure. Trust me, <laughs> trust me, I'm the best, right? And you're like, well, what kind of, that's inane logic, right? It doesn't make any sense. But wait. But that's what happens with ketogenic diets. What if I just, which seems really impossible to do, what if I just stay on a keto diet? I mean, as okay. far as the symptoms and how I'm feeling, right? The A1C is down and the glucose is down and I may have it, but it seems to be in remission. Or it's not. Can I keep it in remission? Yeah. Okay. So that's a phenomenal question. And I'm going to answer that using uh, two, two pieces of data. <laughs> Number one, uh, if you look at the research, what you'll find is that people who are living with insulin resistance over the course of time, even if their blood glucose is controlled. By not eating sugar food, at all or carbs or anything, right? Right. By avoiding the carbohydrate-rich foods, insulin resistance is, is associated with uh, a whole list of chronic diseases, including cardiovascular disease, okay? hypertension being one of those, high cholesterol, fatty liver disease, chronic kidney disease, uh, peripheral neuropathy, poor blood flow in your limbs leading to amputations, nerve damage, which is peripheral neuropathy, and then retinopathy, which causes blindness. And now Alzheimer's disease. Okay, So it's just like this whole cascade of other conditions that are increased as a result of living in an insulin resistant state. So that's the first thing. The second thing, there was a paper that was published recently uh, that demonstrated the effects of a ketogenic diet in more than 260 people over the course of two years. This is one of the most, this is one of the longest term ketogenic studies that we have at our disposal in the research world. And um, what I did was I took a look at this study to try and deep dive, to really try and learn like what's happening over the course of time. So uh, there was a paper that was recently published uh, that documented what happened in more than 260 people living with type 2 diabetes over the course of two years while following a ketogenic diet. And this is actually a really important paper because the ketogenic world doesn't really have that many uh, scientific studies that demonstrate the long-term effectiveness of the approach. There's a lot of studies that show what happens in 10 weeks or three months or six months, but not over the course of years. So I went to this paper to try and, to try and learn what is actually happening. And the, um, what is being projected and told to the outside world is that uh, a ketogenic diet reverses type 2 diabetes. That's what, that's what the press talks about. That's what articles are talking about. And that's what you see to the outside world. People are like, hey, good job. Good job, ketogenic diet. But if you go and you look at this, this, the data, here's what you find. After two years... The hemoglobin A1C value, which again is this marker of whether you're living with diabetes or not, is 6.7%. That indicates that these individuals still have type 2 diabetes. They started at 7.7%, and after two years, they went to 67 but it's still in the diabetes category. Number two, their fasting blood glucose is 134 on average. Mm. <laughs> That's a problem. That's indicate, indicative of type 2 diabetes, anything over 125, okay? Um, their fasting insulin levels are at 16. Anything over 5 indicates that you're living in an insulin-resistant state. Type 2 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, all three of them are indicators that these people are actually not improving their diabetes health, okay? In addition to that, total cholesterol, 194. It's pretty high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, 200 in America is what doctors want their patients to keep it under 200. But as we know, what Dr. Michael Greger has said is that actually the, the total cholesterol at which there are pretty much no heart attacks is 150. And the reason that doctors don't tell their patients to get under 150 is they don't, tr they don't believe they can get there, which yeah. is too bad because a lot of people would be motivated by the idea of getting, uh, being able to avoid heart attacks. So 194 yep. is high. So 194. So the funny thing is that they started out at 184 and their cholesterol went up to 194 over the course of two years. Their LDL cholesterol, which is supposed to be lower than 100, started out at 103 and went up to 114. So the cholesterol is actually moving in the wrong direction. HDL cholesterol is very good at 49. I'll give them credits for that. And their triglycerides are hovering at about 153. So their triglycerides are in a very healthy state. HDL is in a healthy state, but their LDL cholesterol, which is the most strongly associated with a future cardiac event, is hot. And then one thing that I also want to you know, point out, which is very important, is that their C-reactive protein, their high sensitivity C-reactive protein, this is just another thing that you can get tested by a doctor. 
anything greater than one indicates that there's a significant amount of inflammation inside of the total body inflammation, their C-reactive protein is at 4.7, okay? Type 2 diabetic, insulin resistant, high cholesterol, inflamed. But yet the message that goes out to the, to the general population is that a ketogenic diet is an effective solution and diabetes reversal tool. That's a problem. So how did you even find this study? Because my guess is they got it buried after they got those results. No, they did the exact opposite. They're using these results to demonstrate the power and effectiveness of a, of a ketogenic diet. I mean, this is like a very widely publicized paper. And um, I don't know if people are actually taking the time to like dig into the details. It's all it's not. in front of me. But most people just read the abstract and they read the title. They're like, oh, hey, cool. Ketogenic diet. Nice work. Nice work. But, but with right? what okay. you just explained to us, I don't understand how the abstract could say that it is an effective way to, to manage. And because their take standards care. are low compared to a low fat whole foods diet. They're not probably not comparing it against that. They're comparing it against. Well, they're comparing it against, I thought, the, the ceilings that you were just speaking of. The 126 and, and theirs came out 134. Those are those are not their uh, their control. Then the, the numbers that you were speaking of before, I'm guessing. Okay, so so let me. I can even read part of the uh, the the abstract for you here. Um, it basically what they do is they they don't necessarily highlight the the the, the actual data that I was just talking about. Oh. Um, but what they do highlight is the fact that they got their patients with type two diabetes to re dramatically reduce their their use of oral medications and insulin, which again. Hats off to you. That's good stuff. That's but isn't really it only because they're not eating carbohydrates? Well, it's also because they're losing weight. Yeah. Mm. So, yes, the answer is yes, both of those. So, you know, in effect, you take people with diabetes who are overweight and have, you know, high blood glucose and cholesterol, and you get them to lose weight on a ketogenic diet and, and then reduce their need for medication, which is great. But yet, even at the end of that, they still have symptoms and markers of diabetes and high cholesterol. And both of those are problems. We know both of those are problems. Mm -hmm. But again, in the abstract, what they say, they say use of glycemic control medication among those in the intervention declined, including insulin, less 62% less insulin, and 100% less of a different sulfonylurea type drug. Okay. Um, and the control group had no changes in these in, in medication reduction. So they're basically saying we got people to decrease medication more effectively than the control group. Again, that's a really good stuff. Okay. There was also a resolution of diabetes. 53% of them reversed diabetes. Hmm. That's not but, the case though. Yeah. But and, and it depends on how you define a reversal. If you're going right. to define a for using your own criteria, then great. People will reverse diabetes. But I'm saying if you define the reversal of diabetes using the ADA's definition, then you will find that these patients weren't tested to determine whether they actually reverse diabetes. Because they didn't take that, that high, that glu oral glucose test. That's exactly right. What, what do you, so we're talking a lot about what doesn't work. Yeah the ketogenic diet, because it's so frustrating that a lot of people will go to that uh, and end up harming their health in the long run so badly. What do you recommend? Robbie, tell, tell us what you recommend when you and Cyrus work with people, worked with diabetics for years in your Mastering Diabetes courses. So what does work has been documented in peer-reviewed research dating back to the 1920s. So insulin was first discovered in 1921. It was first used in humans in 1922. And as early as 1926, researchers were publishing the fact that as you increase the carbohydrate content of your diet, your insulin sensitivity improves. There's research in the 1930s from Dr. Rabinowich out of Canada, research from Dr. Hinsler from the UK in the 1930s. You have uh, Dr. Walter Kemp in the 1950s. You have study after study after study literally saying the conclusion, the research as clear as day, the more carbohydrate energy you consume and the, as you simultaneously lower your fat content, insulin works more efficiently. So what we do at Mastering Diabetes is we teach people how to eat whole carbohydrate rich foods. 
So that's- And let me ask you, that would be what they were eating in this peer-reviewed research from the 1920s. There was a lot less packaged, over-processed carbohydrates. Were they using potatoes and, and broccoli and yams in these studies so, in this research? So, I mean, to be, to be true to the literature, it's true that they, they did eat processed carbohydrate-rich food, and there were some studies where they did eat whole carbohydrate-rich okay. food. But what's fascinating and is consistent across the board is as long as their fat intake is reduced to less than 15% of total calories from fat, insulin sensitivity is maximized. I mean, in 1971, Dr. Brunzel published a paper where he literally fed his patients a sugar water diet. So we're talking about dex dextrose and protein powder combined. 85% of calories come from carbohydrate, 15% of calories come from protein, 0% from fat because it was a processed diet. So you would imagine that when you feed this to people living with diabetes, he had, there was 13 pre-diabetes subjects in the study. So it was a small study. And you would imagine their fasting blood glucose would go up and their insulin levels would go up. But the exact opposite happened. They saw, compared to the control diet, which was about 40% of calories coming from fat, they saw 9.6% reduction in their fasting blood glucose and their insulin levels decreased. They did a paired oral glucose tolerance test, that exact test that Cyrus was telling you, low carbohydrate community avoids. They did that test in these subjects after eating this very processed high carbohydrate diet and their insulin levels dropped and their fasting or their, their blood glucose levels at every point throughout the oral glucose tolerance test were significantly lower. Again, indicating and the researchers conclude that a high carbohydrate diet maximized peripheral insulin sensitivity. That's what was happening. But then you go into uh, additional research. Um, James W. Anderson did a study where he had 20 males living with type 2 diabetes. And in just 16 days, 50% of them stopped taking insulin altogether and had lower fasting blood glucose levels and their blood glucose control was improved with no insulin. So effectively reversing type 2 diabetes in 16 days. And this was a more whole food diet, mainly starch based with some vegetables. And low and, fat. And you talk a lot about fat. So is there a difference between saturated fat and unsaturated and plant fat versus animal fat? Absolutely. Yeah. So we actually go into a lot of detail in um, our book about that because the last thing that we want to come across as or that we want people to take away from this is that we're somehow like the fat police, you know, and that we're saying you got to eat a no fat diet and all fat fat for you. And it, it's, it's far from the truth. And it's biologically not accurate. Um, you know, fat is present in all foods. You know, banana has a little bit of fat in it. But um, there is a, a fundamental difference between the way that a saturated fat behaves versus an unsaturated fat versus a trans fat. So, you know, the Cliff's notes here are that trans fats that come from partially hydrogenated vegetable oils that are present in all types of packaged foods are the worst offenders by far. And those were associated not only with insulin resistance and diabetes, but also with increasing uh, LDL cholesterol and increasing uh, atherosclerosis. Second to that are saturated fats. And saturated fats are known not only to create diabetes, but also to strongly influence your cholesterol level to increase. So the more, the more saturated fat you eat, the higher your cholesterol level goes. And then in the third uh, type of fat is unsaturated fat, which um, is generally considered to be the safest of all three. Um, and the truth is that, yes, unsaturated fat is more protective of uh, insulin sensitivity. But at the same time, if you eat too much unsaturated fat, then you also can influence insulin resistance as well. So um, I, I know that, you know, under the table, you guys have big jobs with big potato and big broccoli and big mango and big papaya <laughs> and everything. Um, you know, I just want to be open about that to everyone listening. Um, but why don't we know this? Why don't we know what you're talking about? Why can't I find any of this on American diabetes? I spent probably 45 minutes on diabetes.org uh, before this interview. And I put in the search, what causes diabetes? What is the root cause of diabetes? Does fat cause diabetes? Does sugar cause diabetes? They don't know. Nothing comes I up. Wish, I, mean, I wish we had the answer. I, I really do wish I could tell you exactly why this is not caught on. Uh, maybe hopefully our book can turn things around and this can really snowball. But I think there are legitimately a lot of very smart people who are sincerely confused. 
And I think a lot of this comes down to the confusion about what is a truly low fat diet. So you will hear researchers cite repeatedly, we conducted a randomized controlled trial. We compared a low carb diet to a low fat diet and the low carb diet performed much better across the board. And when you look at those studies, they weren't actually a low fat diet. They were not a low fat plant-based whole food diet where we have a maximum of 15% of calories coming from fat. They have a range between somewhere, you know, the twenties up to 35% of calories from fat is considered low fat. And these diets include animal products. They include the saturated fat that Cyrus just explained is problematic. They include dairy products and they're trying to claim that this is why a low fat diet didn't work. And you also hear people say, oh, in the 1970s, America was told to follow a low fat diet. And then all these new products came out, these low fat cookies and low fat crackers. And we tried it and then people became more obese and more overweight. And the reality is we never actually tried a low fat diet. And a matter of fact, our total grams of fat per day increased. It's just that our total calories per day increased Therefore, we dropped by about 3%. I think it was like 39% to the 36, something like that, which is ridiculous. We, America never tried a low fat diet. So there's a lot of sincere confusion about what's going on. And hopefully, you know, we can change that. And I also will say diabetes in particular is one of the few chronic diseases you can self monitor meal by meal. You do not know if your heart disease got better or worse after one meal through any objective test. But with diabetes, you can. And Cyrus, as he explained earlier, people, they eat a banana, they eat some quinoa, they test themselves and they see, wow, my blood glucose is spiking. They just don't have the knowledge and the information and the resources to figure out why that's happening and get through that transition phase to actually see their body experience insulin sensitivity and be able to eat those foods. Now, you two are type 1 diabetes, which means that your pancreas doesn't secrete the insulin necessary uh, to open that, that door to the, to the cells to let the sugar in. Cyrus is very clear that type 2 diabetes can be reversed. But just for our audience, what's the situation with type 1? So we, we currently do not have a solution to reverse type 1 diabetes. I would love for that to happen. Um, I've, that's how I got into this whole thing. I really dedicated myself to what do I have to do to get the stem cells in my body to create some new beta cells in my pancreas. It seems so simple. I don't know exactly why it's so complicated, but the reality is when it comes to human biology, creating new beta cells is quite difficult. And for people living with type 1 diabetes and also type 1.5 diabetes, we have these antibodies that are present. And the current scientific knowledge is that these antibodies are attacking insulin or insulin producing beta cells. And therefore, even if we were creating new ones, the antibodies would just kill them. So we don't have a solution. But so what you're doing is you're managing so that you, you don't have to inject as much insulin, which can be unhealthy. Is that correct? Right. Is that how so you're trying to be is, healthy? That's as a great a question. Yes, exactly. It's a great point. So People who are living with insulin dependent diabetes. So this could be, you could be, a, we make this distinction in the book. You can be a insulin dependent type two. And that means that you don't have antibodies, but your pancreas has been exhausted over many, many years of being insulin resistant and producing more and more and more insulin. The beta cells end up getting exhausted and you have a low level of insulin production. So you can be insulin dependent type two. You can be type 1.5 and also type 1 where you require insulin because you just don't produce enough in your own body. In that case, the goal is to inject the same amount of insulin that your pancreas would have normally secreted before the beta cells were damaged. That's the goal. So it's not necessarily like less is better. Like let's just inject as little as possible because then you'd say, hey, you know what? I'm just not going to eat carbohydrate energy and I'll get less and less and less. But that's not necessarily going to solve the problem. So we're looking for a physiologically appropriate amount and you want to maximize your insulin sensitivity. So just like Cyrus said, you can reduce your chronic disease risk. People living with type one diabetes do not die of high blood glucose readings. We don't die of having a high A1C. We die of the complications of diabetes, namely heart disease. That's the number one cause of death for people living with all forms of diabetes, including type one. So that's why we care about improving insulin sensitivity in the long term, but in the short term, 
It helps us achieve our ideal body weight. It makes us, uh, you know, not have brain fog. It makes us think more clearly. So just being insulin sensitive in general also has short-term benefits in addition to making it easier to manage your blood glucose levels. So those are some of the benefits we're looking for for insulin dependent. So going back to what we were talking about earlier, this just the mass confusion that's out there. Um, for somebody who's living with diabetes or loves someone who's living with diabetes, why, when they pick up this book, will they not feel more confused? What did you guys do different? Because I know you did. Okay. I'm, I'm super glad you asked that question because if you, if you go to Amazon or you go to a bookstore and you just go to the diabetes section and you type in the word diabetes, you get bombarded with 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 different books about diabetes and all of them have a different promise to you, right? And the promise is eat this diet, you'll reverse diabetes. Eat this diet and again, it can be confusing, right? So what we do differently or what we are attempting to do differently in this book is we are going all the way back to the 1920s to learn about what researchers first discovered about insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance when insulin was first discovered and sometimes even before insulin was discovered okay there's a lot of brilliant brilliant insights that were gained way back in the day that researchers today in the diabetes world today have built upon okay a lot of people like to say oh well that's old research you can't pay attention to old research and the idea is actually no you're right it is old research but there's some really valuable insights which still remain true today okay so I just so, want to add to that because this whole old research thing comes up so much. It's, it's old research that has been consistently proven decade after decade after decade and has never been demonstrated to the contrary. Okay, there is no research that there's somebody said, oh, hey, you know what? We conducted a study in, in 2018 and they did an actual low-fat plant-based whole food diet just like you teach, just like the decades of research, and we actually saw an opposite result. It has never happened. It is consistently the same result. So I just want to add that. Important. Okay, very good. So <clears throat> there's, there's over 100 years of research, which we've sort of gone through in painstaking detail. And then in addition to that, we're also trying to educate people about the fact that even though there's like a dietary trend or a dietary fad that might look interesting and appealing and have a nice cover, if you dig deep and try and understand what's actually happening from a metabolic perspective, you might see a different picture, right? And a ketogenic diet is a perfect example of that, a low carbohydrate diet in general, you know, they look good from the outside. They are, they are phenomenal band-aids. They really are. And what we're teaching people to do is dig deeper. I want you to go deeper. I want you to understand what's happening, not only to your cardiovascular health, to your diabetes health, um, but what's happening in the long term, right? What's happening over the course of one year, two years and beyond. And like, let's, let's learn as a, as, a, as a collection of scientists and people looking to become healthier, let's learn from the evidence that already exists and try and come up with some logical conclusions rather than just taking a surface level look at something that appears to be good without actually digging for more relevant information. Mm -hmm. And embolden people to think deeper, to think more for themselves, to think more critically, which we could use a lot more of that just in every day, right? Because we just take in the marketing and advertising and go, ah, that makes sense. I'll try that, right? Like <laughs> really start thinking for ourselves. Imagine that. It's like Sarah said, I mean, you have to look at, actually look at the research. If you just read the abstract, you're not going to understand what's going on. You have deeper. to really truly understand what's under the hood. So a lot of it is old research, but there's also new research. And you do talk about intermittent fast fasting, especially with diabetics. My gosh, we were always taught, keep your blood sugar even, and that's the best thing. And so don't go too long without eating. And now your book recommends intermittent fasting. Yes, I'm glad you brought it up because intermittent fasting has become, you know, arguably one of the most popular dietary trends, you know, the world has ever seen. I would argue that it's it's only second to the ketogenic diet in terms of like the most popular trends in the world ever. Um, but it's important and it's actually, I'm very happy that it's a trend um, because when I was in graduate school, we did a number of experiments on mice and rats to try and induce insulin resistance and in diabetes and then rescue that 
using intermittent fasting, using various intermittent fasting strategies so we could learn about what, how it actually functions. And every single time we do the experiments, regardless of the degree of intermittent fasting or calorie restriction, we would see improvements in their diabetes health every single time. Okay, but Cyrus, as someone who's a vegan and a long time, just the animal model doesn't convince me. And I know, I, so you need to tell me about humans. Um, how does it work right. in humans? Right. So these animal models, you know, they're, they're not 100% translational, but they, they serve as a basis. And there's actually many research groups that have gone and done studies in human beings that have tested very similar strategies about, you know, calorie restriction versus, you know, 16 hours of intermittent fasting, 18 hours, 24 hours, alternate day fasting, modified alternate day fasting. I mean, it's endless. But the take home message here is that when you perform intermittent fasting, intermittent fasting is a, a tool you can implement in your life to uh, extend the window of time where you're not eating any food. You've got zero calorie intake. That's like its definition, intermittent fasting. I would say that's my it's definition. Of period. Of okay. Right. Okay. So it's you're manipulating the timing of your food intake. Okay. You don't necessarily have to manipulate the total amount of calories that you're eating. You can. But even if you were eating the same number of calories, instead of eating a little bit for breakfast, a little bit for lunch, a little bit for dinner, what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to change. You're going to fast for, let's say, 16 hours and then eat only for an eight hour window. And just manipulating the timing can have some pretty dramatic effects. And so intermittent fasting um, is a tool that helps accelerate the rate of weight loss. First and foremost, so people who perform it can find that it's easier to lose weight, and because you're able to, you know, lengthen the amount of time in between meals—16 hours, 18 hours, sometimes 20 hours—and as a result of that, you're just literally not taking on as many calories. As a result of that, you put yourself into a caloric deficit, and by being in a caloric deficit, now you start to lose weight. So cool. in those eight hours, they don't eat the calorie. Um, equal of what they may have eaten in 24. So you're you're in a calorie deficit with intermittent fasting, even though you're eating in those eight hours, you just happen to be eating less calories total. Okay, so let's say you're doing a 16-8 fast, just like you're describing, and you're 16 hours of fasting plus eight hours of eating. Um, in that eight-hour window, you technically speaking, you have a green light to eat whatever you want to eat during that window, okay? The question really becomes, if I gave you an eight-hour window of, of opportunity to eat. Can Dotsy eat the same amount of food in, a, in an eight-hour window that she would have normally eaten in a full day? Absolutely. I'd be so freaked out that I'd have 16 hours not to eat that I would overeat during that eight-hour Yeah, hour and window. well, that's the but, brain of somebody who, But I'm you also, know, I'm thinking, I mean, I think Dr. Greger talks about intermittent fasting, and I think he, he says that even if you eat the same calorie load, there's still an effect on your metabolism. Yes, absolutely. So, um, so to answer your question, you know, my question to you is, could you eat the same amount of food in an eight hour window? And you guys both said yes. Okay. And that, <laughs> that's a true statement. I could probably do the same thing. Yeah. But if you're eating a plant based diet, <clears throat> it becomes harder. And the reason it becomes harder is because a plant based diet is incredibly rich with fiber and water. And that tends to, to, to make you fuller quicker. And as a result of that, you don't take on as many calories as if you were eating meat, cheese, bread oils, chicken, fish, you name it, right? Um, okay. Now, secondarily, just like you said, Dr. Greger has talked about in his new book, How Not to Diet, about the fact that even if you don't change the number of calories you're eating, simply by changing the window of opportunity, you can still get dramatic benefits. When it comes to diabetes and cardiovascular health, some research has actually shown phenomenal things, that um, extending that fasting window has a, has, a, has a direct biological impact on your muscle and liver and heart tissue. They, it has an effect on all tissues, but in particular, your muscle, your liver, your heart, your vasculature, um, they love periods of time where they're actually not exposed to nutrients. And they, they perform a lot of like housekeeping functions and they sort of like have all this, you know, accumulated fatty acids they're stored over time. Um, and they start to like burn that for energy because they have to go internal and find where am I going to get my energy from if it's not coming from the blood? I got to get it from somewhere else. So they start to housekeep and burn the stuff that they've oxidized over the course of time. So they initiate this cellular recycling program, and, and that cellular recycling program is known as autophagy. That's like a, a new term that people have become familiar to. And the idea is that they start to degrade a lot of cellular components, 
and then use that and then recycle those components to create new molecules that actually are beneficial that extend the longevity of those cells. Okay. So you don't have to reduce your calorie intake in order to get a lot of these benefits. As far as insulin sensitivity is concerned in particular, when you intermittent fast, it's so powerful at increasing your level of insulin sensitivity that even without exercise, even without weight loss, you can get dramatic improvements in your ability to put glucose into tissues. That's it. You can get a dramatic improvement in how well insulin can talk to these tissues and how easily you can put glucose inside. And that's a good thing. So intermittent fasting is something that we included in our program because we see tremendous results. It does help people lose a lot of weight. And as a result of that, they can resolve a lot of insulin resistance. And that's a huge bonus. You have, you talk about four components to mastering diabetes. Can you give us a overview of what those are because they're outlined in the book. And so people have an idea of what they're buying. Of course. So number one, low fat plant-based whole food nutrition. Number two, intermittent fasting. Number three, daily movement. And number four is daily documentation through a tool that we created called the decision tree. So each one of these is powerful in and of themselves. If you just implemented one of them, you would see improvements in your diabetes health. And so when you put them together, you get this sort of compound benefit that's it's pretty miraculous. And so, I mean, we just talked about intermittent fasting. We've talked a little bit about low fat plant based food nutrition, daily movement. It's really just understanding where you're starting from and making progress towards more and more movement. I mean, people living with diabetes, just walking, just walking is a game changer. And we want people to build up to more strenuous exercise, you know, 30 minutes a day, about six days a week, six to seven days a week. And that's going to have the biggest benefit. But a lot of people just aren't there. You can't ask somebody who's, you know, just not stuck on their couch to go run marathons. So we take them step by step and help build, you know, really goals that are realistic. Put it that way. But the decision tree, that's a really a, a pretty profound tool that we're very excited about. And we used it personally to have it transform our lives. But it's basically a process where you document your daily lifestyle decisions and you see how that impacts your medication needs and your blood glucose levels in a chronological order. So you know what adjustments to make and how to communicate with your doctor as you go through this process. So the program is so good at making you more insulin sensitive that you will become over medicated very quickly. So if you're not communicating with your doctor, you can have dangerous low blood glucose levels. And the decision tree is a tool that can help proactively prevent that. And it's also helping people understand what are they consuming. So we do encourage people, again, I know this is probably not good in the you know eating disorder world. So we have to be sensitive to that and every client is, is unique. But we do teach people to use nutrition logging software simply to understand how much fat are you consuming in your diet. That's the real crux on that decision tree of are you actually consuming way more fat than you think you are and what's that doing to your blood glucose levels, which you can see once it's documented. And again, we do not encourage people to have to do this for the long term, especially if they're living with prediabetes and type 2. We want them to just never have to think about calories or fat, just learn what foods to eat, eat them when they're hungry until they're satisfied. Type 1 diabetes or type 1.5 or insulin-dependent type 2 you do need to know how many grams of carbohydrate you're consuming so you know how much insulin to inject. And again, you talked earlier about how this information is just not taught, like it's just not covered. And the amount of times that we come across people in our coaching program that have never been taught that your carbohydrate to insulin ratio changes at different times of day is mind boggling. Like diabetes 101 is sometimes missing for people and that's definitely covered in this book. So. You need to document and know what's the ratio of carbohydrate to insulin at given times of the day. And the decision tree helps you understand that with full clarity. It's a knowledge is power. I mean, the, you, ha you have to know what's going in and what the effect that it's having if you have. So, Robbie, what's your favorite story of transformation? One of your favorite stories, I'm sure there's many, um, that you guys have experienced at Mastering Diabetes. There's so many but I have to go, I have to go with Tammy because just because Tammy lives in Southern California and I had the chance to get to meet her in person 
and go shopping at the farmer's market. And when she joined our program, she was skeptical. Like she's this perfect example of somebody who has accumulated a lot of information. She had watched Forks Over Knives. She knew who Rip Esselstyn was, but she was still in this mode of, I'm living with diabetes. I can't eat high carbohydrate rich foods. I can't eat fruit. So I met her early in the program at the farmer's market and I'm buying a bunch of oranges and she's just like, I don't believe you, Rob. There's no way that I can eat all those oranges. Like, this is no way. Like, this is not. And she was kicking and screaming and not really listening to us. And eventually, one time, she's at the grocery store and she t- talked to Cyrus on the phone. And Cyrus was just like, buy this, buy this, buy this. And just, eat it. just like, stop making a fuss. Just do exactly what I tell you to do. And, and she did it. And she had an incredible transformation and she had some good data. So, um, Cyrus was talking a little bit earlier about you know, fasting insulin levels. She had an A1C of 7.1%. She was using 2,000 milligrams of metformin per day, and her fasting insulin was 17. And like Cyrus said, it should not be – definitely eight is like the high, high end. Somewhere around like five is where you want to be, all right? So she's very insulin resistant. That's clear data that her pancreas is pumping out a lot of insulin, still has an elevated A1C, even with diabetes medications that are supposed to help. So she adopts our program. And it, it, this, is, this is like the seven-month data, but it's gotten even better since then. That's seven months, she lost 34 pounds. Her A1C went to 5.3%. She wasn't taking any metformin anymore. And her fasting insulin was down into the five. So I think it was like 5.1. So and what about is, the oral glucose? Because that's what we care about. That's what I learned from today. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so good question. If she did, I mean, she's sort of doing an oral glucose tolerance test almost at every single meal because she's eating well over 100 grams of carbohydrate at every single meal. Mm -hmm. When people adopt our program, you're going to be eating 300, 400, 500 grams of carbohydrate even at the lower calorie levels. Mm -hmm. So she's doing that, seeing her fasting insulin level drop, seeing her blood glucose in perfect range and her A1C in perfect range, the non-diabetic range. That is a person that is glucose tolerant. That's a person that's carbohydrate tolerant. So yes, she could absolutely go and drink a 75 gram liquid solution and see a fantastic um, profile throughout that um, all glucose tolerance test. No questions asked. Okay. So that's she also, story. first fatty liver disease. She also, she couldn't, she had pain. She couldn't go to the grocery store. She couldn't climb up pyramids. So I remember the day she posted a picture of her climbing to the top of a pyramid, I believe it was in Mexico. And just saying how I couldn't do this last year and my life is transformed. Now, we saw her recently at a conference. She's lost 64 pounds. She continues to inspire other people. And she's just a a great story. That is a really, really great story. And I know this book is going to change millions of lives. Thank you so much for writing it. And people who are uh, watching or listening to this show, go back to episode nine learn even more about diabetes and about Robbie's and Cyrus's story um, and buy the book. For, if not for yourself, then for somebody you know, because we know right. you know people who are either pre-diabetic or, on their, um, or already have type right. 2 diabetes. Right. And iTunes is funky, so nine might be missing but it's not missing from our YouTube channel. And you get to see these beautiful faces. <laughs> if you go to the YouTube, it is definitely on there because, uh, it, yeah, today it, we, you know, we miss your all's whole journeys yourselves and they're powerful and interesting and people need to hear them. Yeah. Everybody on YouTube, I want to apologize for eating during the interview. <laughs> <laughs> no, we love it. We love it that you're eating. <laughs> if I wasn't living with type one diabetes, I could have just like put the food away, but I injected insulin. So and I have my continuous glucose monitor telling me what my blood glucose is. And it's like, if I don't eat, I'm going to crash. And nobody and we don't like you crash. We, we needed your brain. The cameras were not going to be showing me eating. Somebody <laughs> got to watch me eat with my fingers. I, I apologize when we eat together. We'll eat gracefully and, and, and kindly with our silverware. I don't know. I eat with my fingers. I prefer it that way. You do. So, yeah, you eat your I potatoes. Do. This yeah, whole we, look, dipped in garlic. Yes. Yeah. Dotsie and I had lunch and I just <laughs> I, I eat utensils and you have fingers. Jeez. <laughs> All right, y'all. Congratulations on the book and good luck. And keep spreading the gr- the incredible word that y'all do. Yeah. And, and you know, I also want to say thank you guys, first of all, for having us back on the podcast. You know, it's the second time here and we really appreciate the opportunity. Um, you guys are doing such a tremendous job of spreading the, the, the true benefit of teaching people the true benefit of 
Number one, avoiding dairy products, which we didn't even get into in the diabetes world. That's a whole different story, yeah. you know? <laughs> but in addition to that, also just adopting a more plant-focused diet because as you guys know, as we know, it's like once you kind of drink the plant-based Kool-Aid and you really like do it, you it feels, you can feel it inside of your body. and you can, you can see it in so many ways. You can see it on your blood test. You can see it in your skin. You can see it in, in the way that your breath doesn't stink anymore. You know, you have less body odor. I mean, better dental health. It's just, it's like a top down full body improvement. And my point is that you guys have been doing a phenomenal job of spreading the word. We appreciate it. You know, I am groupies of you guys and I continue to watch as you guys are making a big, big, big impact uh, in the world of nutrition. So thank you for what you do. Ah, uh, thanks for getting in mutual. touch. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for getting yeah. in touch. We appreciate it. We really are honored to be able to to help you with your book. Anything else we can Super do, let us know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. And we'll All get right. it in that window. Yeah. On that, whatever that okay. Wednesday in is. But anyway, we'll, you'll, you'll get everything from us. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye, Thanks, guys. Bye. Such a pleasure. Okay. All right. Yeah. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future. <laughs>